our education system and i'm so sorry to say this it is just beyond pathetic sir so there are two problems here. Economist Sanjeev Sanyal. Sanjeev Sanyal. Sanjeev Sanyal, who many would better know as the principal economic advisor to the government. So, what is this Hindu rate of growth? So, instead of blaming bad policy and calling it the Nehru rate of growth, so let's blame it on uh, India's cultural roots. Germany just has a population of 8.38 crores, and yet their exports stand on the upwards of 1.6 trillion dollars. And here. We have a population of 1.4 billion, and yet our exports barely touch 800 billion. So why is there such a big gap, and what are we doing to fix it? I could give a long lecture on you know how we can improve this. The MSME sector of India employs 100 million people. It contributes close to 50% to our exports, and yet it is one of those sectors which is just struggling for capital. Why is that, sir? What was it like to do business in India in the 1980s, and how is it far different? today in 2024 no amount of lecturing will teach you economics better than having your fingers burnt in a market crash let me tell you this sir i actually disagree with that lecture thing and i'll tell you why Hi everybody this is a conversation that i had with the economic advisor to the prime minister himself who goes by the name sanjeev sanyal and this entire episode involved a very heavy production and we were able to bring this episode to life only because of the kind support of our sponsors build school build school is a specialist in ai education now people we all know that ai is changing the world but what if i told you that ai is actually making the dream of achieving financial freedom and making money on the internet very easily possible for professionals recently i heard about whatsapp who is an indie hacker and he is one of the best in the game he has transformed his ideas into reality using ai and no code and today he earns close to 1 crore rupees per year and build school is hosting whatsapp himself for a master class where he would be sharing how he builds products using ai and no code which makes him almost 1 crore a year now this is usually a paid workshop but for the first 1000 think schoolers this workshop is absolutely free whatsapp's journey is a proof that you can leverage ai to transform your life which is why growth school is backing him whatsapp will teach you everything about how to turn your ideas into reality with frameworks from ideation to monetization now imagine turning your dream projects or ideas into reality with the help of ai Does this sound interesting to you? If yes, then don't let your ideas remain just ideas. Act now, seize this free opportunity. Click the link in the description to join the master class for free. And now, on with the episode. Good morning, sir. How do you do? All good, sir. Welcome to the Indian Business Podcast, sir. I've been watching a lot of your interviews and podcasts and I really admire the way you explain your answers using examples and case studies and data points. So today what I want to do is I want to take this conversation further and deeper and try to understand what exactly is the definition of great governance and what is India's approach to become a 10 20 trillion dollar economy and what are the most important hurdles that we face as a country and what are we doing to overcome those hurdles to become a 10 trillion dollar economy and there's no better person than you to answer these questions sir. So My first question is coming from the economic story of India sir. I remember that when Modi ji went to the US he specifically mentioned that the last time I was in US India was the 10th largest economy but today India is the 5th largest economy. To most people these may just seem like numbers and a large segment of the population also believes that we have become the fifth largest economy merely because of our population. But sir you have been a participant in the economic story of india so sir what exactly have we done so differently in the past 10 years that we have taken this big leap to become the fifth largest economy so uh, first of all we need to understand these numbers and let me put them in context so when we began liberalizing our economy i began become serious about economic uh, policy making in 1991 we were only a 200 Seventy billion dollar economy, so we were that small. It then took us sixteen, seventeen years till two thousand and seven, eight to become a one trillion dollar economy. Okay, that long how much took? From there, it took us seven years, okay, to twenty fourteen, fifteen to become a two trillion dollar economy. Now, from there, it should have been faster, but then uh, uh, you know we 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 took about. 
about uh, another seven years odd, uh, partly because of COVID, to become a $3 trillion economy, which happened in 21-22. Then it, we added another trillion dollars uh, in just three years. So we were a $3 trillion economy in 21-22. This year, in the year 2024-25, uh, we'll be close to $4 trillion. So another uh, trillion dollars being added in three years, a little over three years. So the reason I'm making this point to you is this. People forget the power of compounding. Okay, China, everybody says, oh my God, this is now a $19 trillion economy, impossibly big. Do, do remember that they got here through compounding. And people learned compound interest rates in school, but they forget how powerful it is. In the first few years, it doesn't seem to matter. And then a few years later, it just blows up. So this is the important thing. So this power of compounding, what, what we are benefiting from, this number, of course, is a nominal number, not a real number, but our economy last year grew by 8.2%. It is growing at double digits in nominal dollar terms. And uh, this year, again, it will go by 7% in real terms, in, oh, again, probably over 10% in nominal dollar terms. The point I'm making is this 10 percentage point compounding is massively powerful. So we are now at $4 trillion. It take us two, a little over two, year, uh, two years. Somewhere in 2007 or so, we will become a $5 trillion economy. Along the way, we will go past Japan, which we should do this year or early next year. And then another two years from there to go past Germany to become the world's third largest economy. So what I'm trying to say is, <clears throat> this is basically that compounding process. Now, of course, people will say that even when we are the world's third largest economy, five trillion dollar economy, etc., we will be a per capita terms poor. No doubt about it. We'll be the fifth largest economy now, then third largest economy, but we already are the by some margin the world's largest population. So one divided by the other, not surprisingly. The number is small, and it's barely three, a little, uh, around about three thousand uh, dollars per capita. Remember, U.S. is at eighty thousand dollars per capita. Even if you adjust for purchasing power, we, we will still be at a little over ten thousand uh, dollars per capita. Okay, so we are a poor economy, not as poor as we used to be. Admittedly, we used to have barely, uh, you know. 300 and something, 330 dollars or something uh, per capita in 1991. So from there we have grown a little less than 10, 10 times. So no doubt that we are much less poor than we used to be. That, that extreme kind of poverty I remember from my childhood is now restricted to much smaller areas and a much smaller segment of society. But yes, we are still very, very poor. And the solution to this is to keep this compounding process going. Everybody uh, got here through compounding. We are not going to be an exception. China got through it. The West went through this compounding process. They just started in the 19th century, um, through the 20th century over a long period of time. We probably don't want to spend that much time getting here. But even if we go for an East Asian model, it was still compounding. So the first point I want to make to you is, no matter how you think about this, this is about compounding. And we have now reached a critical mass where that compounding is really beginning to count. Okay. And so that point I was making is that we are adding that extra trillion dollars faster and faster. Mm -hmm. And that's how basically, that's basically the, the, the point we have reached. Mm -hmm. Now, some people will say, and the point you were making, is that this is only happening because we have, la we have a large population, we are very poor and so on. Well, utter rubbish. We had a large population and we're even poorer in the 1960s and 70s. We didn't grow. We only began to get, get going serious about growth in the 90s. Why? Because we began to have sensible policies, right? So. The, the, the point I'm making is that sensible policies matter. Simply having population doesn't get you there. Mm. Simply being poor and therefore having a catch-up doesn't get you there. Not only forget India's own 
uh, you know, uh, history of being very poor. Well, there are uh, many, many countries in the world which are much poorer than us. Uh, much of Africa, uh, there's Pakistan, Afghanistan. Why aren't they growing uh, faster than us? So to make this case that we are growing faster because we are poor is utter rubbish. We have been even poorer in the past and we didn't grow. So what exactly have you done differently in the past 20 years because of which this compounding is happening? Little more than 20 years. It really began in uh, the 90s. Uh, the first step, obviously, was to um, with the 1991 reforms. I, I, I would count it as just like 1947 mm -hmm. was um, political freedom. Uh, 1991 uh, begins the journey to economic freedom. Mm -hmm. So we first of all broke out of this extremely corrosive socialist uh, uh, framework. And of course, it happened not because we suddenly changed our worldview, it happened because we had a crisis and, um, you know, the Soviet bloc collapsed and, you know, things changed. But anyway, nonetheless, we've, since we began to introduce sensible policies, first thing that happened is that we began to withdraw the Indian state from things it should not do. Okay. So that entire licensing Raj, that entire thinking process, and allowing the private sector innovation and all these kinds of things. That is a very important reason why we began to grow. And that process has taken us 30 years. And let me say that we are, we even today, are reluctant reformers. Um, but that process has gathered pace and we have become more and more bold in what we have done. So, for example, if you go back to the 90s, we did do you know, in 91, 92, maybe up to 93, we did a whole bunch of bold reforms. Once the economy recovered from the crisis, we actually stopped doing reforms. Really? Yes. So it's quite striking that in the second half of the 90s, we did some reforms, the odd one here, there, but we actually didn't do reforms. We got growth. By about 98, 99, that growth momentum that we had got from that first round of it, that began to falter. So it's only again under the Vajpayee regime that another round of reforms happened. Mm -hmm. And that generated the growth that you got in uh, from around 2002 to 2007, 26 or thereabouts. Then, unfortunately, after the Vajpayee regime, again reforms were, uh, few reforms were done. So one of the problems is that we get, a, we do a bunch of reforms, we get growth because of it, and then we say, okay, now things are fine, so we don't have to do any more reforms. So again, by 2007, 8, we got the uh, global financial crisis. But here in India, the, the, the benefits of the Vajpayee reforms also then ran out, and we hadn't done reforms. Then for the period from 2007 to uh, 13 or so, we, instead of doing reforms, we tried to keep growth going by essentially uh, pumping up the uh, banking sector and you know encouraging it to go out and give random loans. So what happens as a result of that? We do get some growth. We do recover from the uh, global the shock of the global financial crisis. But because it is based essentially on expansion of the monetary and fiscal and b financial expansion, and it is not based on actual so supply side reforms. What happens is that by about 2013-14, our banking system begins to uh, be questioned, uh, our macro fundamentals begin to wobble, uh, there is, you will remember, you know, we began to be counted as the fragile five and so on. So, <clears throat> again, growth begins to kind of be under pressure. Anyway, the, 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 that decade of uh, the 2010s, uh, the teens, uh, saw global growth slowing generally because everybody had problems with their financial sector and so. So we were, first of all, in a slower global growth environment. Our own banking system then had to be cleaned. And so uh, in the years 17, 18, 19, we went through a fair amount of uh, pain because we had to clean up our banking system. Uh, uh, something I was also one of the participants in it. Many others also contributed to this cause, uh, several RBI governors, uh, governor, Deputy Governor uh, uh, Acharya, Deputy Governor Vishwanathan, Deputy Governor Jain. There were banking secretaries here who did uh, a lot of great work. Uh, there was uh, Anjali Dugal after her, um, a banking secretary uh, uh, Rajiv Kumar. 
um, and so on. And so I'm mentioning them because you see very often people forget the contributions of uh, people who are one layer below the top layer. Mm. So of course there was contributions from uh, Governor uh, Patel, Governor Das and so on, and the finance minister, uh, Jaitley, uh, Prime Minister, all at the very top level, but I'm mentioning the layer below that also who put in a lot of effort. And then the banking system got cleaned up. At simultaneously, we did a one major reform, the GST. I mean, you can complain about the GST all you want. But the fact is, it is a dramatic improvement on whatever was there before. I'm not saying that the current system cannot be improved. I think it can be. It needs a lot of simplification. Mm -hmm. But whatever it is, with all its flaws, it's a dramatic improvement on what was there before. Mm -hmm. We introduced the insolvency in bankruptcy court. So, you know, this whole business of carrying around mm -hmm. uh, defunct companies of the past mm -hmm. and putting them in BIFR, which is basically a warehouse for dead companies. Mm -hmm. You know, finally we began to shut down these companies and large companies were shut down. You know, whether it's Jet Airways or uh, these whole bunch of steel companies, uh, and so on. So then one, of course, for the banks that was good because you, you, you created, credit, you know, imposed creditor rights. But generally speaking for the economy, it's good because you are giving economic assets uh, from, uh, you know, and these are productive economic assets from a inefficient uh, user to an efficient user and so on. So there is this uh, change uh, and big bunch of reforms that happened, which of course, there was a period, of course, then had the two years of COVID that we had to go through. Then what happens is that on the other side of it, we, because we had done all these reforms, cleaned the banks, you know, we begin to benefit from all of those. And so the important part of the thing is that we need to keep doing these reforms. Okay. We have to be unapologetic about ease of doing business, ease of living. Uh, simplifying the thing and I am a big advocate of something called process reforms. You see everybody loves big structural reforms mm -hmm. but it's actually a lot of the gain in efficiency comes from small process reforms, nuts and bolts, you know this process here, this rule here mm -hmm. and uh, if you go and look at the articles I write or the speeches I give, I talk a lot about these nuts and bolts that you, small changes you keep, have to keep changing. Mm -hmm. And so those are the things that suddenly get your system to grow. Mm -hmm. And none of them will hit headlines, mm -hmm. but somebody has to pay attention to them and keep changing them. And uh, you know, while I am a big advocate of certain kind of structural reforms, uh, I have written extensively about and I have participated in formulating a lot of these smaller changes, which people in that little sector will know about, mm -hmm. but widely people may not know. Okay. So if I were to summarize your answer, it is, we went from being a state on economy to a market on economy because of liberalization. We got rid of our socialistic frameworks. And then we introduced several policies like IBC. And in the process of that, we also stagnated with our policy reforms because of which we entered into a banking crisis. And then once we got in IBC and reforms like that of GST, today we are in a much Today, yes. we are much better off as compared to the past. Sir, I want to go a little deeper into this uh, market on economy and state on economy. And you mentioned the socialistic framework. You know, because we were born in the 1990s, we are not able to appreciate the market that we exist in today. So could you please throw some light on what was it like to do business in India in the 1980s? And how is it far different today in 2024? So the best way to uh, understand this is get up one morning, See if you can find somebody who owns an old ambassador car. Preferably one before they introduced the Isuzu engine in the 90s. Okay. So a really old ambassador car, just try and drive it. Okay. okay? You will realize what the problem is. I mean, you know, the gear shift is not smooth. It doesn't, you need to, five times to get it to get into the right gear. It rattles when it goes, the speed is up and down. Uh, it'll break down on you all the time. Uh, and as I said, the ones that are still around are mostly the ones from the 90s on Isuzu engines. Try and find if there's anyone, one of them left from the pre-Isuzu Isuzu ambassador car. Mm -hmm. They were awful. Okay. And when we finally, when, when, when I as a, as a teenager finally encountered a, a Maruti 800, it was an absolute revelation. Maruti that, 800? A Maruti 800. Okay. That was the, that was the major... Uh, uh, sociological event of my childhood, okay, okay? Uh, was the Maruti 800 because suddenly you had a car that actually functioned. Okay, okay. People don't understand this, and since very often they have not, they don't remember the pre 
you know, improved uh, ambassador, which even after the improvement, it wasn't a great car. Okay. But you should really go back to the pre-Suzu engine ambassador to understand what a dramatic shift it was. Now, this doesn't mean that after the 1991 reforms, we became a great place to There's a lot to be done about our ease of doing business, etc. But what has happened is at least there is a mindset that came that doing business was a good thing. And that at least some of the state chief ministers, etc., began to think, yes, maybe attracting business is a good thing. I mean, these are radical ideas at one point in time. Because radical. They were radical ideas. You know, just like you hear, some of the rhetoric is still around. Okay, that business you know, is a bad thing. Yes, absolutely. Okay. You hear it in a diffuse way as Adani, Ambani, etc. <laughs> but when I was growing up, it wasn't Adani, Ambani, it was Tata Birla. So you would hear, oh my God, uh, you know, uh, this is bad because Tata Birla will take advantage of it or something. And remember, I grew up in 1980s Kolkata. Hmm. Okay, 70s and 80s Kolkata where they actually threw out business. Threw out? Threw, threw them out. So people don't realize that before uh, Bangalore became the tech hub of India, most of these international tech companies and people with technology-oriented uh, sort of businesses or inclinations, they used to be based out of Kolkata. Okay. Okay. I remember in the 80s, there being actual large-scale strikes against the c computerization. And this, remember, first generation of computerization happened. I mean, proper computerization is being attempted. That it is, computers are going from some esoteric thing in you know, a few industries or in, in university or uh, uh, scientific labs or something to something that is being more widely used in the 80s. There was a huge pushback, as a result of which the industry actually moved uh, to Bangalore. Why, sir? Because, you know, as I told you, and this is why you have to understand the framework in which you think about an issue, the narrative framework of how you think about something is absolutely critical. In the narrative framework of socialist India, but specifically concentrated in um, of uh, communist ruled West Bengal, the narrative framework was that you cannot grow the cake. It can only be divided. So it was only about whether you um, divide the cake between the computer and the incumbent clerk or whoever was going to get replaced by the computer. The idea that you could upskill the person and use the computer to do more things uh, simply wasn't a part of the conversation. So you're saying that in the 1980s, business was a bad thing. And uh, I also read somewhere, sir, that uh, back then the tax rates were so high that the highest tax lab was somewhere around 93.5%. No, no, it 1970s. was 97% uh, plus. 97%? In, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the 1970s. Okay. And it was brought down significantly after that. But, you know, uh, that was kind of uh, a part of that entire thinking process, yes. So the government was thinking we'll just tax the rich and then pass on the welfare to the poor. Uh, no, it helped them. Basically, you have to understand the political economy. That was the rhetoric, Garibi Hatao and so on. But this is really about political power. Okay. And so what were, what were they trying to do? Essentially, uh, the political establishment and the bureaucratic establishment of that time essentially ganged up and they said, look, let, let us introduce power on the whole system. How do we do it? We nationalize whoever we can. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we nationalize the airlines, we'll nationalize the banks. What are you basically doing? You are introducing control over the whole system. Mm -hmm. And it was well understood even at that time mm -hmm. that all of this was a bad idea. That is one of the funny things about this is this, that this idea of called license Raj mm -hmm. that we use even to this day is not a term that we came up with after we had done it and it turned out to be a bad idea. Okay. License Raj is a term used in the 1950s by Rajaji when he's trying to warn the political establishment, more, more, uh, more generally the public, that this is a bad idea. So there are economists like Shenoy who are warning people that this is going to lead to bad outcomes. And it does lead to bad outcomes. So in the 1960s, our economy basically falls apart. We have to, you know, go begging to the Americans for food aid. Mm -hmm. 
and the 70s our economy again collapses we have very high inflation yeah that's why the emergency one of the reason one of the big reasons the emergency was introduced was mm. because there was huge amount of turmoil mm. okay and in the it continued into the 80s you know this kind of thinking although by the mid 80s finally we began to relent and you know rajiv gandhi began to ease things up a little bit but point of the matter is this was the thinking process so you have to understand that this had a lot to do with the politics of the time and the imposition of control and uh, by the you know uh, the the political leadership of that time that did not want alternative sources of uh, uh, power and so the nationalization of banks has uh, even at that time was thought to be a bad idea in fact people do not understand that in, even earlier in the 1950s the lic that you see today is the result of a large number of nationalization of insurance companies which were then amalgamated into lic and within few months of that happening there was a massive scandal called the mundra scandal okay in which it was discovered that this um, uh, that this lic now big entity it its money is for being used to for all kinds of political purposes uh, to fund you know politically linked uh, uh, business and so there was a big scandal i interestingly the then prime minister's son in law is the one firoz gandhi who is the one who in the parliament brought it up okay and uh, the then uh, finance minister ttk who had to actually uh, resign and um, it was a big embarrassment for the prime minister especially since his, it was his son in law who had brought it up and so he never spoke to his son in law ever again damn so concentration <laughs> so of so this power. is one of the reasons by the way interestingly hmm. firoz gandhi's name never comes up in any yeah. conversation because firoz gandhi was the person who actually uh, opposed some of this uh, uh, you know uh, clear um uh, grab of resources that the, the his own uh, uh, you know in-laws were doing interesting so sir it was concentration of power by the government and then spreading this narrative that business was bad which eventually stunted our growth is that it absolutely and then when it all went bad they then said it was the hindu rate of growth so what exactly is going on here this is again a part of narratives okay okay so 60s 70s so uh, sorry 50 60 70s happen you have now run this system based on the socialist thing it has now failed for a l- significant period of time and by this point in time you already have korea taiwan singapore etc they are have a different uh, who have changed their policies and are succeeding so it is quite obvious by the late 70s that this uh, socialist system is a disaster so now who do you blame it so you blame it ha huh? hindu rate of growth it must be because you know those hindus and their social customs are all outdated and it is because of them so what is this hindu rate of growth so the hindu rate of growth is the na- we were growing at 3 3 little somewhere 3 and a half percent and that time the population growth was 2% so basically there was no per capita growth that was happening so instead of blaming bad policy and calling it the nehru rate of growth so let's blame it Uh, on 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 uh, india's cultural roots so the entire thing was then blamed as the hindu rate of growth okay you will see this term still used yeah. but what why was it used it's a lot of how you m- create you know narratives about whose failure it is it is not the failure of socialist policies so the po- the, the, the the narrative that is being sold it's not that nehru and nehruvian policies failed uh india it is india and its cultural roots that failed nehru okay so What that is how that, sir? of course that's all politics you basically when you failed you blame the victim hmm. and how did people believe it i mean what is ah, the this is the, you should ask the intellectuals of that time okay um why they were and in fact one of the things that i keep pointing out to you that even though it had clearly failed and by the 80s it was more than little visible and even you know in many of rajiv gandhi's uh, statements you can see that you know he is acknowledging uh, 
that this system had broken down. I mean, he makes a statement that for every rupee that the government spends on welfare schemes, uh, 85, uh, I say, uh, disappears, so 85% leakage. So he's acknowledging that this is happening. But still, the intellectual class continues to support these bad ideas. Because in many ways, they are the beneficiaries of that system. Mm. Ah, because the, the elite of that system is largely uh, bureaucracy and so on. And they are the beneficiaries of the system. Similarly, the, uh, the business class of that time, uh, they may crib about various things. But the fact of the matter is they are protected from all kinds of competition. True. Yeah, so never confuse capitalism with the personal interests of capitalists. Mm. Okay, so when in 1991 our economy finally collapses and we are forced to do these reforms, be very clear that the intellectual class of that time, and I was at university at that time, they were not in favor of the reforms. There were very, very few economists of that time who thought it was a good idea. They all argued against it. But importantly to remember, even the business community large, not everybody, but largely, they also argued against it, even though you would think they were beneficiaries from it. They are not. Business community as a whole benefits, because it will grow, etc. But individual business does not, because they now will face competition. Yeah. If you're producing inefficient, poor quality products and are able to get away with it, you are now afraid that, you know, new competitors will come, foreign, com uh, uh, foreign uh, competitors will come, and you will not be able to compete. So, in fact, ironically, Indian business also argued against it. Interesting. So now I want to come back to 2024. And now that we are in the capitalist era in the Indian economic story, while we've become the fifth largest economy in the world, I think, sir, we have to rethink our benchmarks and we have to get rid of all the Pakistan narrative and the socialist era narrative. And we have to stop comparing ourselves with those entities. And what I believe is the right comparison to make would be developed countries like Japan and Germany. And I was just doing a case study on Germany and I found something absolutely stunning. Germany just has a population of 8.38 crores. And yet, their exports stand on the upwards of $1.6 trillion. And here, we have a population of 1.4 billion and yet our exports barely touch 800 billion. So why is there such a big gap and what are we doing to fix it? So first of all, um, we have to remember that, uh, that for a very long time, as I said, this is also a part of that legacy. That I, we were not integrated to the world. So we had this import substitution mindset. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so, and of course it protected all kinds of internal interests. So we kept ourselves closed. We, it's only in the 90s we began to open it up. And fair enough, we did it carefully. I think we were correct in doing that because if you open things up too fast, you'll get chaos. So we took our time to do it, which was fine. But I think we have, we then reached a point where we became, we are now, you know, even that number that you gave is of recent origin. True. You have to add to it the fact that we also became competitive in services, which, uh, is partly an artifact of the of of the fact that we liberalized our economy in the post digital age. So we therefore that is a market that would not have been available to other countries. So we have taken advantage of that. But in manufacturing, I would argue we can do a lot better, and that requires us now um, to be, be much more aggressive in. And you will see that we talk a lot about manufacturing, and even though there are people who argue that in India should somehow just use the services pathway. Um, you know, this government has been strongly stating over and over again that, you know, we, why should we give up manufacturing? There are many benefits to this. Uh, one is that, you know, we happen to be unique in that we have a domestic market that allows leveraging up. We have, we have one of the few countries which actually have the skills to absorb this. Uh, we already have many of these big companies here. And there is this general China plus one environment. However, that is the good side. The However, the bad side is the world economy is not growing. Mm. So it's always easier to grab uh, market share uh, in an environment that is expanding True. rather than one that is stagnant. So uh, the Chinese had the advantage that they did this in the 90s and 2000s when the world was globalizing very rapidly. And therefore, you know, in an expanding environment, you can grow fast anyway. Now we are in a stagnant global environment, uh, relatively speaking, and we have to 
grow in that. Now, I'm not saying it will remain like this forever. I'm sure the world goes through cycles. We'll also get a good, good phase at some point in time. But while we are waiting for the cycle to turn, we have to keep investing on the supply side of the economy. Mm -hmm. That requires that we invest into being competitive. There's many things we need to do. First of all, we need to get our trade-oriented infrastructure up and running. Okay, trade-oriented okay. infrastructure. Yeah, so that means that you know our highways, our airports, our uh, business processes in the, the, in the customs, uh, our ports uh, are up to speed. And you can see that we are building, for example, we have, you know, our ports have become a lot more efficient than they used to be a decade ago. True. Uh, radically. Um, similarly, we are building this massive new port in Vadhavan, just north of Mumbai. Our airports uh, are not only a lot better than what they used to be, but also uh, we are building these brand new airports uh, in many places, but two really big ones, one in Navi Mumbai, one east of Delhi uh, in uh, Greater Noida and so on and so forth. Um, so that is one part of it, just getting the physical infrastructure up and running. The second thing is that we need to get our business processes um, up, to, up to speed. Some progress has been made in this, and I will give you some examples of how things have improved. For example, um, patents, okay? Just six, seven years ago, we used to do just uh, 10,000 patents a year. That's the number of patents we used to grant. And more than half of it used to go to multinational companies, which were just regularizing their patents in India. So they are not real innovations in, in India's context. Okay. In the last financial year, 23-24, we did one lakh patents a year. So in seven years, we have increased the number of patents granted by the system 10 times. Okay. How, so, sir? By improving processes and doing a whole bunch of things. And I've written extensively about it. You can read about it. Okay. Okay. So that's one kind of... I'll give you another kind of process reforms. You know, everybody talks about ease of entry. But actually, for an economy based on creative destruction, you need ease of exit as well. Ease of exit? Yes. You know, how easily can you shut down a company? And I'm not talking about companies that are shut down because they go bankrupt. Those are forcibly bankrupt. I'm talking about voluntary shutdowns. In fact... 70, 80 percent of companies that shut down, in fact, maybe even more, maybe 90 percent of companies that shut down in any one year are not shutting down because they went bankrupt. Okay. They're shutting down for a variety of reasons. You know, the um, guy who's running the company has got fed up of running it because whatever, it's grown old, his son doesn't want it. Or they can be a large company that is shutting down a subsidiary. Any number of reasons why, for entirely voluntary reasons, uh, companies get shut down every year. Now, earlier, this was a real headache to shut down a company, even when nobody was objecting to it. It was not like there was a case that was outstanding or there were some outstanding, some amount, or there was some dispute. No. Mm. There were large numbers of companies which everybody agrees it should be shut down, but it would take years to shut them down. Why? Well, they were, they were, the processes were ridiculous. For example? Sir? You had to get NOCs from various people. You needed your company's name to be published in the newspaper. That, for some reason, would be delayed. And there's a whole risk, and I've also written about this extensively. Okay. Now, about a year ago, mm -hmm. we created something called CPACE. Okay. Which the uh, Ministry of Corporate Affairs created. They simplified all the processes, and they've automated it. Guess how long it takes now? So, what used to take years, three, four years, now takes 90 days. 90 days? 90 days. We are the mm -hmm. fastest place in the world to shut down a company voluntarily if there's no dispute. Interesting. Okay. So, why I'm bringing this up to you is that, you know, you can dramatically change something, you pay your attention to the processes. Mm -hmm. So, we are not paying enough attention to these processes. There are thousands of them. Mm -hmm. You know, our metrology, uh, legal metrology lo laws, these are the laws relating to labels and weights and measures and things. You know, we need to simplify them. We need to, we, you know, there's a lot of uh, unnecessary criminalization of, uh, of uh, uh, things which, which lead to harassment, rent seeking and all kinds of things by officials, all kinds of things happen. Okay. So we need to simplify them and create. Similarly, you take our income tax system. The rules are still very complicated, but the process, thanks to being put online, has become radically easier. The refunds come through much more, much more quickly. They are, things are all connected. We have anonymized it 
so hopefully the amount of uh, you know random harassment etc has gone down so point i'm making to you is that we are at every step we are trying to improve it is not that this is perfect and with every change some other wrinkle appears also so you know we have introduced the gst we certainly a dramatic improvement on you know the plethora of of rules state level octroi all kinds of garbage we used to have has gone but there are all kinds of kinks in the system even today people keep complaining about the gst system the kinks in the website doesn't work for some reason similarly in the in, in, uh, the uh, ipr regime we have solved significantly for patents but there are problems with the trademarks guys so we are continuously trying to improve but there has to be a single minded attention to these uh, process reforms because i think <clears throat> everybody loves grand structural reforms but in fact much of the friction in the system is in the process interesting so you're saying that we first need trade oriented infrastructure and we need process reforms large numbers of them and as a matter of course that every day we get up make things better which will help us improve ease of doing business eventually Absolutely. increase that is exports. ease of living also hmm. not just ease of, many of these things relate to just day to day living i mean the ease with which for example and 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 the integrity of the process hmm. uh by which i get myself a passport a driving license all of these things have hopefully become significantly better in uh, uh, in recent years not just making it easier the integrity of the system has to be still there i mean you still want to make sure the guy who gets a driving license actually knows how to drive mm -hmm. so the integrity of the system is also important so here's where the narrative of red tapeism comes into play right could you please explain what exactly is red tapeism sir and how is it hindering our economic growth So this is the point I was making all this while. Uh, all process these, reform is about getting rid of red tape. Okay, so I think one of the major reasons why India also lacks in achieving exponential manufacturing growth is also because we are competing with China in terms of prices, whereas Germany is competing with quality. Because I was reading about the Mittelstein companies in Germany, and I saw this map of Germany where Mittelstein companies were spread all across the country. and 80% of these companies were located in those towns which had a population of less than 1 lakh and germany as of 2022 had 1400 world market leaders so these companies were not market leaders in germany they were market leaders across the world and when i looked deeper into what was the fundamental reason why they were market leaders i understood that they have hyper specialized in doing one thing for example there's a company that just manufactures fridges that's all there's a company that just makes wires and there's also a company which has been making beer for a century but they do it so well that they do not have to compete on the basis of price well i think that's a simplistic view but let's go back to a little bit of the history of how germany got here mm. do you remember that germany was united into a country only in 1870 yeah so it earlier it was actually a network of uh, small kingdoms mm. and each one of these small kingdoms had a um capital and uh, some sort of a hub when it then got united into a uh, country in 1870 by bismarck uh, these hubs were all over the place so the way they worked rather than uh, the way it worked in other countries so there are other developed countries where the logic worked differently okay okay so for example in uh, the uk uh, there were very large clusters so there were three very large clusters one was in Uh, around london mm. there was one in the midlands around birmingham and there was another further north in the north of england there were so three big hubs and that's basically where it happened and then it, it has now a lot of deindustrialization has happened so london has remained as the main hub now okay same thing has happened with uh, Par uh, with france with paris paris is overwhelmingly the largest economic hub of so this has not happened in germany partly because of history and the dispersed nature of it mm. Uh, even in india um so history very often plays a role so if you look at gujarat for example gujarat because it was dispersed into a number of small kingdoms interestingly mm -hmm. even today it has large numbers of economic hubs True. it has got uh, you know you'll have uh, rajkot ahmedabad uh, surat uh, baroda and so on uh, they are all by the way many of these were capitals of small kingdoms and so on um i'll uh, give the contrast with that with say uh, west bengal which uh, had you know one major hub kolkata um, or and so on so <laughs> history does play a role in some of it 
uh, how it develops. And sometimes the highly concentrated model can also be extremely successful. I mean, Japan has an extremely concentrated model with one really big city in Tokyo and then one or two other hubs, uh, Osaka or whatever. Uh, but Osaka is much, much smaller than Tokyo. So, uh, let's not confuse success with the peculiarities of a decentralized model of, of uh, Germany. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, Germany does it in this particular way. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> Germany's model, which I think the more interesting part is, um, I mean, there, there, is, there, there is the issue of decentralization, which is in urban design and, uh, and geographical, and that's a different conversation. Let me focus on, the, on this business of small, specialized companies, middle start basically, which does an amazing job. And I think here also, we tend to overstate the case. Many of these middle starts feed into larger companies. So do remember that they are not entirely independent bodies from the bigger companies mm -hmm. uh, that they feed into. Nevertheless, it is true that Germany has this culture of many of these companies and they have done an amazing job. So there is many things why it succeeds in doing this. One of them, of course, is this amazing uh, system of apprenticeships that they have where people uh, that are there. And there are many other uh, reasons with it. Um, but the point that you, you made uh, about Germany competing on quality and China competing on price uh, is actually no longer true. China now is rapidly competing in quality as well. There are many areas where they are genuinely at the cutting edge. And much of that technology is learned from, stolen, whatever you prefer, <laughs> from the Germans. So I think one of the real big problems that Germany is will now have is being able to compete with this rapid growth of China and moving, which is moving up the value chain and doing. So, uh, so I personally don't think there is a uh, choice that India has of competing, going the German way or the Chinese way. Uh, the Chinese way uh, competes on both fronts. And in many ways, uh, the, while we cannot exactly replicate their model because our political system is different, etc., etc., but there are a few very key things to learn here. First of all, go into an industry and in the beginning, do not get emotional about where in the value chain you are. Okay, even if there is a big industry and all you're doing there is turning the screws, go into it. That's how China got into electronics, right? The first thing they were doing is just pure assembly. True. So do not, you know, many people in India said, oh, you know, why are we only going into, um, you know, the lower end? We should go into the higher end. Hello, mm -hmm. before you can run, you have to walk. Mm -hmm. The same, you know, very often you'll hear these sort of derogatory terms about, you know, Indians are only doing cyber coolie work. Well, actually, you have to start by being a cyber coolie. Um, <clears throat> in fact, India's entire software industry is based on a non-event. It's called Y2K. So don't have any emotions about dirtying your hands at the bottom of the pyramid. Mm -hmm. But then you have to have ambition. And, you know, we have now shown ambition uh, Indians are showing ambition in the sense that you see uh, when you say uh, artificial intelligence is being developed by, you know, these top uh, Google, is that the other. Do remember that a lot of this is developed in India by Indians in the captives of these companies in India, mm -hmm. number one. Number two, the ambition that we have of moving up the value chain of Indian companies doing it. That, I think, is something we need to encourage. Mm -hmm. So it's not the lack of ability of Indians. After all, Apple is able, is increasingly making its phones in India. Uh, foreign companies are able to, uh, 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 you know, compete in uh, various markets around the world based on Indian research, Indian development, R&D, and all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Even Google Maps that is used worldwide uh, is an Indian invention. It was in, invented in the Indian offices of Google. Mm. So India, Indians are able to do it. The question is why is India's corporate sector? And I have now for the last half an hour, 40 minutes, criticized Indian uh, bureaucracy, government, etc. Um, and the need to reform them. I think this is a criticism I can fairly make about India's corporate sector. Mm. Again, the lack of ambition. Mm. Okay, it is extraordinary that Indian companies, which are now global size companies, they are not small companies anymore, uh, they are hugely profitable for the last several years, and 
the amount of R&D Indian companies do is ludicrous for their size, okay? Uh, and I, you know, Indian generics manufacturers, okay? They're not small companies. Why aren't they the guys who are now creating cutting edge molecules? Maybe there are some uh, rules and regulations, et cetera, that we need to change on the India side. Yeah, fair. You know, that's what the government needs to do. But I think a large part of it is simply lack of ambition on our corporate sector. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, the, this, uh, the poverty of aspiration, which I often blame on um, other parts of the system, uh, needs to also be, uh, is also true of our corporate sector. Poverty um, of aspiration. I, absolutely. I can vote, uh, you know, why are Indian companies not aspiring to be world leaders in certain things? Um, and that will require you to invest in R&D. You go into the R&D uh, departments of Indian, co Indian companies, large Indian companies, and there are some notable exceptions. So, you know, I'm painting them with a board brush. But generally speaking, you wanted those German Mittelstadt company, go and see them. Small companies doing enormous amount of research. True. Okay. Is it because our... Our education system is not generating great scientists. I'm sorry, you go and meet these middle start. They come from very mid-level, um, you know, it's not the top engineering colleges in Germany. It's the middle ones. Even some of them have just been apprenticeships. So they're not highly educated in that sense. But there is a culture of continuous innovation that happens. Here, there is an unwillingness to dirty your hands. So and that is that is very important. It's it's the engineers who need to run Indian companies, and it really bothers me that even where engineers did create Indian companies, the next generation of those family-owned companies then become basically MBAs and become managers. True. They are not the guys going back there and doing masters in chemical engineering. Their dad who set up the company was a chemical engineer. This guy is a pretty boy who has got an MBA from fancy school in, Amer uh, in America, uh, good at PowerPoint, but cannot actually fix the uh, machine. And this is an issue. So I think we need to begin to get serious about a culture that does this. And this, as I, I keep, you know, we Indians are not being ambitious enough at multiple levels. So two things that you mentioned that I found very interesting are the poverty of aspiration and number two is education. I want, to, I want to dig deeper into poverty of aspiration. I actually spoke to a lot of these MSME owners and manufacturers and what they often complain about is the Chinese dumping the products in the market. So if they're producing something at five rupees, the Chinese dump it in the market at four rupees. So there is no way they could make a profit. And when I spoke to them about why don't they invest into R&D, one primary reason that they pointed out is the lack of capital. And that is when I started reading about Okin, which India is recently getting into. And that is what made me think that the MSME sector of India employs 100 million people. It contributes close to 50% to our exports. And yet, it is one of those sectors which is just struggling for capital. Why is that, sir? Why is our So MSME there are many reasons for it. Um, and I could give a long lecture on, you know, how we can improve this. First of all, we need to lower the cost of capital in this country. Mm -hmm. I think in the, that is something that will happen naturally as we become a, a more developed country. The cleaning up of the banks was an important part. Um, the um, bringing back a credit culture. Because remember, if there's poor credit culture, then the good debtors are paying for the bad debtors. True. Right? So I think we need to lower the cost of capital in this country significantly. Some of it has happened. Okay. Okay. If you look at the equity markets today, you know, good companies are getting massive premiums. True. No problem getting capital. So I don't, maybe historically true, but at least at, at the margin, this problem is becoming much, much lesser of a binding. Mm -hmm. Similarly, if you have a really good startup and you have a great idea, mm -hmm. you will get money. Mm -hmm. So I think at the margin, um, this idea, this problem is dissolving itself. Mm -hmm. There is, however, two problems. One is, again, going back to my earlier discussion we had about the, the, the reptapism that is still embedded in our system. Mm -hmm. You know, the con it's not big things very often. Mm -hmm. The big things have, in fact, been resolved. It's the continuous fiction of uh, regulation. Mm -hmm. 
ओवर रेगुलेशन हेरासमेंट एंड रेंट सीकिंग दैट एट द ग्राउंड लेवल इज अ मेजर रिस्ट्रेनिंग फैक्टर ऑन मिडल मिडल लेवल कंपनी इज ग्रोइंग बट आई विल से that we need to you know there is a general national problem of poverty aspiration <laughs> that we have uh, you know a lot of our talent for example in this country uh, would rather uh, you know spend years doing the upsc exam which with a 99.9% failure rate than um, take a risk in pursuing a business uh, or some other profession didn't you have to become a writer or an athlete or something else something some form of risk taking even though your success rates are higher there true so therefore there is a culture problem here which cannot be solved by the government it is a, something we as a people have to begin to think about after all the same people go abroad i mean i cannot believe that people go abroad uh, to the us and make a fortune or go to dubai or uk and make a fortune right how do they do this why are we able to do this more successfully outside of our own country than in india the same person's cousin who is equally talented is unable to do it why um because i think one part of it is this whole red teaism the whole thing but some part of it we will have to accept as a society is a poverty of aspiration which restrains you when you live here but you get liberated from when you are forced to uh, do something in some other society mm. so i think the only difference between india and the us and you just mentioned that the same person goes on to do extraordinary things in the us i think that is primarily because of the education system sir our education system and i'm so sorry to say this it is just beyond pathetic sir and i am the perfect by product of the education system my college had a rule of 75% attendance i did my civil engineering and we were building something called sewage treatment plant and uh, my professor actually wrote a stat on the board which said that if the population increases by 30% year on year this is the amount of waste that is going to increase so calculate the amount of waste and then build an stp and the first argument that i put forth was that if the population grows at 30% hmm. we are going to collapse so aren't we supposed to think about how are we going to reduce the amount of waste that each person puts out rather than building an stp and he had no answer to that and that is a clear indication of i would say that's a clear anecdotal evidence of how our education system functions no there's a lot of problem with the education system so there are two problems here is a, a lack of performance due to education system alone and two should we improve the education system i think the two should be separated okay. the reason is you see what happens is this debate otherwise goes into the following let's fix the education system and then we will get growth actually this is not how the world has functioned okay. china grew with bad education system mm. most of the guys who created these great companies are not very well educated please go and meet the average uh, chinese billionaire he is not very well educated mm. yeah dhirubham ambani was not as well educated as his uh, his descendants uh, are mm. but he created so first of all this whole idea that we know first we have to improve our education system then at some point i'm sorry if you go back and look at all the great companies of today in america with that great education system okay uh, let me tell you uh, bill gates college dropout uh, zuckerberg college dropout um uh, Uh, you have uh, many of the guys uh, uh, today may have an uh, undergraduate degree um, you know uh, so <clears throat> the point i'm making is that first of all we uh, this is part of that poverty of aspiration uh, that we have is that uh, you know we will do only after finishing a phd can you do some great thing no <clears throat> that is the wrong way of thinking about it uh, in fact that is some part of our colonization of being clarks Uh, that you know you can you know you can only do great things if you remain within the nice british education system and work your way up uh, grade 1 to grade 2 clerk and so on so this uh, uh, is part of that problem so please you know i'm all for improving the education system but let us please separate this from uh, you know the need to get on with uh, a more innovative economy a more risk taking more all of this is a is a cultural issue it is not an education issue okay so let me okay so i want to make this clear but otherwise we go into this circular thing however we do need to uh, improve our education system because there are benefits from that too 
here i would say we could spend the next 30 40 years trying to fix each college in i think it's too difficult to do this my own view is that the way we deliver education worldwide not just in india is already too outdated it's a 19th century idea of giving lectures okay why do we need to give the same lecture in every college worldwide when we have youtube you just need to give a good lecture once and everybody on the planet can watch it okay and then answering questions can be done by artificial intelligence i mean how often will there be some one person in thousands who will ask a unique question which ai cannot answer okay for that you can have one supervisory professor so the reason i'm making this line of thought out to you is this while you may need still for primary education the old classroom kind of thing just to get people on the rails a lot of tertiary education can be automated on a mass scale i am a firm believer that tertiary education can be made almost free okay okay colleges should not be wasting their time on giving lectures they should become places for research they should become certification and testing systems but giving particularly undergraduate level lectures is a complete waste of time okay okay now in some subjects you may need like medical etc you need to have hands on so fine this will not apply to them but i can't see why my subject economics cannot be completely automated except for special projects so you go to college you do some special projects maybe a few this thing testing and what happens then is you can dramatically expand the amount of people who study these subjects um you know infinitely in fact so i believe that you know we are trying to solve the problem in the wrong way sir i think i sir i actually disagree with that lecture thing and i'll tell you why the example that i gave you about my professor my own best friend when he went to the us he was given a very similar problem statement but the difference in approach was that the professor conducted the lecture to provoke a particular discussion and debate about the entire town no no so fine city. fine you so therefore you need to have face to face interaction for doing a limited number of projects true fine do it but just imagine if i then completely automate this lecturing business okay and then i then the same professor can take 500 classes instead of taking 5 true because he's only taking uh you know doing the things where face to face interaction that you do project there are places where you need human interaction i agree with you but just imagine the same iit campus today you're sending there people for four years they sitting that whole campus now you know a few times a year you call in people to do these things that are needed otherwise it's all automated and you have tests and it's not like people can't use their time to do other things and then we create a much more apprentice based system let people let young people go and work let them go into the factory floor and we are all talking about uh, german system the german system is based on our, uh, apprenticeship i mean throughout history 18 year olds used to work what's the big deal even today some of our most skilled people are doing this Correct. think of getting a chartered accountancy degree chartered accountancy is not uh, based on your bcom most of those guys are working they are take, taking most of their classes online Uh, and you are creating chartered accountancy highly skilled job Correct. okay now you are able to create them now you cannot tell me that you cannot create lower skilled activities like economists mm. i'm sorry <laughs> it is not a very high skilled job okay, okay they, they are good economists and bad economists that's a different issue mm. but it is actually requires less uh, face to face interaction mm. a lot of economics can be generally taught and then take these guys the skill of economics is in the doing put them into think tanks put them into policy making put them in financial markets okay no amount of lecturing will teach you economics better than having your fingers burnt in a market crash let me tell you this so you're saying that sir we have to strike a perfect balance between automation thought provoking lectures and apprenticeship which will give the student yes so and so now the point i'm making is the model i'm saying is actually cheaper mm. the guy is working 
he's spending less time doing useless lectures which he can anyway do online in fact why does he even have to listen to his college lecture he can listen to the best in the world mm. so why have we done this in the past 10 years no no far, there are two reasons for it one is it was not possible okay till relatively recently it takes some time for systems to catch up the second is as with any uh, innovation the incumbents of the system will resist it so today's academia is not going to be deeply happy about this any more than um you know lawyers are going to be happy with ai driven uh, you know uh, legal systems or um in the past i mentioned you know the clerks in kolkata being deeply unhappy about introduction of computerization the same thing will happen here uh, the difference is that obviously uh, uh, academia has much greater control over narrative building so they are going to resist this but i am telling you this is the future so the last question that i have is about gst and this is something that i asked nirmala ma'am also so i just thought i would get a much better answer from you more elaboratively and this is about uh, gst being a gst being a consumption tax and not a production based tax so just to put it in context for the audience if 100 rupees worth of t-shirt is sold 18 rupees gst is collected out of that 9 goes to the center 9 goes to the state and this 9 rupees that goes to the state it goes to the consumer state which is let's say up and not the producer state which is tamil nadu and here's where governments like tamil nadu often argue that when we are the ones who have spent so much into building factories and incentivizing these businesses why are the consumer states gaining benefit out of it and not us so how do you explain that sir so there are two parts of it first of all let me talk people get need to understand why there are multiple points of taxation <clears throat> there many people love to say you know let we should have one tax and everybody pays it no <laughs> you see the moment you create one tax the entire economy will change itself to not have to pay that one tax mm. so you need multiple points hopefully light taxation so that people can be captured in the tax web in at in multiple ways so you do need direct taxes which are more towards the producers if you can call it and then there are con the consumption and taxes there are the now that is the indirect taxes and direct taxes so first of all you need both of them if you have only one and too much of one everything the entire economy will uh, fit itself uh, it will change itself to try and avoid that one tax so okay. that's one two about this distribution well first of all the producer state is benefiting massively from many of these things as well it's not the case. after all jobs are being created in that state there are um, uh, 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 you know uh, more workers consequently they are also consuming they are also consumers so the consumers the producer state benefits massively from having production in their state to say that they do not benefit from it is utterly wrong um <clears throat> now of course the consumer is a important part of the equation and by the way there are many offsets along the way so it's not like because the consumption is happening in the last point they're getting all the taxes there there is a whole bunch of people along at each point the tax is being paid uh, so if further up the somebody produce thread they got an offset so it's not like the last guy is getting in fact that is one of the points about gst that's a value added based it is not based on uh, sales and therefore the final point so i i'm not certain that your uh, example is even accurate okay. okay now well the fact of the matter is that um, uh, we do have a system where i personally think it's a reasonably fair system you can change it around but let me tell you not going to solve it if there are large consumer states um, it is fair there there probably also large population states and they need more taxes uh, if for whatever reason you 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 have higher growth in your state uh, including uh, this uh, production ca capacities you are presumably also generating higher gst from you know you, you have after all t-shirts is not the only place gst is there you cement you're getting higher from construction uh, material uh, from the fact that workers many of them may be from up who have now moved to tirupur mm. 
so i i am not so sympathetic to these these kinds of arguments as maybe you may think so but occasionally you may require to do some balancing mm. but generally mm. speaking a simple system that applies to the whole is probably the better thing i am much more sympathetic to simplifying those slabs mm. uh, simplifying categorizations mm. uh, getting rid of bugs in the uh, in the in the in the uh, website Uh, and so on and so forth okay so if it was so straightforward then why did we introduce the gst compensation because there was an earlier system okay there was an earlier system you cannot suddenly change to one system mm. and say that you know uh, overnight all our um, uh, my, I, I, my you know my expenditures are based on a certain framework mm -hmm. but you have been given a long time to transition so that it was a transition thing we all agreed as a country mm. that this is a better system and i don't think anybody seriously wants to go back to the old system I and mean, if you want to please go and talk to people how things work before 20s you see people love criticizing the current system which is perfectly fine for improving it but never try to go back to you know that should by under no circumstances an argument for going back to the earlier system which was a disaster I mean, there were multiple taxes. There were state boundaries. It was an absolute mess. Mm. So there is now been a transition. State government should have adjusted to that transition. They we provided compensation for it. In fact, for COVID also, extra compensation uh, time was given. So yeah. this thing has been extended longer than uh, these uh, would have been the case. Uh, now you know states do need to uh, play by the current system. understood sir thank you so much for your time sir it really means a lot i was able to understand everything and i just hope everybody else also understood thank you so much sir thank you very much